This video serves as an introduction to investment management. We'll briefly compare and contrast an investment management course versus a financial management course versus a personal finance course. They all sound the same, but I'll disentangle what, what these courses mean. There's a bit of an overlap between them, but nevertheless, they have different perspectives on finance. Then we'll review returns and risk. And I say review because you've seen this before in the prerequisite course. Prerequisite course is financial management and financial management is often called a corporate finance course. So either, either one, uh, a basic financial management course or a corporate finance course is what I'm assuming you had as a prerequisite. Then we'll introduce the concept of risk-adjusted returns, which blend returns and risk together in a, in a single calculation. Then we'll discuss and compute dollar-weighted returns, and I'll introduce some investment strategies used throughout the course. Now, let me move over to pen and paper, and we'll start covering an analysis between investment management courses and financial management courses. Now, moving on to paper, let me compare and contrast the various finance courses that I talked about in the introduction. Okay, when you took a basic financial management course, you took the perspective of a financial manager of a corporation. You could think of it even as the treasurer of a corporation. And the corporation had assets, the corporation had liabilities, and the corporation had equity. Now, what made it a finance course was, look, this side of the balance sheet finances this side of the balance sheet, the assets. So what we talked about was companies issuing bonds, issuing common stock, right? And that common stock and those bonds were sold and cash was generated and then cash was turned into investments or projects. Okay, so we had project A, we had project B, project C, it could be a product line, could be a division, could even be a machine. And so look, our balance sheet balances because assets equal liabilities plus equity. And so you can think of this as, okay, this is how things started out. And then if you want to be a little more graphic, you can think, look, the goal of the corporation is to expand the market value of its assets. And if it expands the market value of its assets while bonds and even loans remain fixed, what happens is this side grows, this side gets bigger, this dollar amount gets bigger on this side, and this liability component stays relatively fixed. And what happens is the equity increases. That's your ownership. People, somebody owns this corporation. They own these shares. So that was the perspective of, of a basic financial management course. Um, and by the way, we looked at the risk of return of the various projects. We looked at the risk and return associated with bonds. We looked at risk of return associated with stocks. We looked at portfolio concepts. Okay. So now, um, where we are in this course, this is an investment management course. And so it's basically you. So here you are. You have a portfolio of assets, liabilities, or a balance sheet of assets, liabilities, and equity. Shouldn't draw, a, shouldn't draw a line here. And so you're gonna be owning investments. We're not really worried about where you got the money to fund these assets. We're gonna look at this side. We're gonna say, look, you got a pool of money. Let's say you got, um, and we, when we play the stock track game, you got a million dollars, right? It's just given to you. We're not worried about where it came from. We're not worried so much about the big picture. You got a million dollars. What's the best stocks and bonds and portfolio to put together? What are the risks and returns and those trade-offs? That's this course. This is an investment course. Now, compare this to a personal finance course. A personal finance course is broader in the sense that they ask actually ask the question and analyze, well, how do you actually get the money to fund your assets and to fund your investments. So how much should you save? And not only how much should you save, but uh, what, what's the risk and return associated with, those, with that savings process? And not only that, but even broader. For example, you know, it, it, it'll go into, the course like that will go into insurance. And it'll be property and health insurance and life insurance and so why is that personal finance? Because, well, 
you can spend you you can put together the best portfolio in the world in this course investment management course but if you're not insured for your health life and your property you get in an accident your house burns down you have health issues see this this disappears to zero not only could it disappear to zero but you could have a big fat liability here now that you're going to owe the hospital or you're going to owe somebody through a lawsuit so with a personal finance course it's much broader and it's looking at the whole picture investment management is focusing on stocks and bonds to buy and the risk and return trade-off assuming you know exactly how much money you want to invest and then the corporate finance course you know introduced a lot of these concepts from the perspective of a treasurer who issues bonds issues stocks to fund investments generally we call them projects a b and c we looked at the like i said we looked at the risk and return trade-off we looked at the cash flows present value calculations and um, it was a good introduction to investment management and it's a good introduction to a personal finance course so now let's move on now this course is, has a series of notes I have them uh, on the web and so the this is introduction returns and risk it'll give you learning objectives uh, it'll give you space now look I wrote in some notes for myself here but what this is designed for you to do is to print this off or have a copy of this somewhere because I'm going to basically go down this list this this these notes and I'm going to do the calculations and so as you can see I got the calculations done and I got space for you to do the calculations exactly where I put my own calculations and so that's basically the way the course works you'll save yourself a lot of time and effort if you have these handy and fill in the gaps because I'm not going to write type out all the all, all these formulas with the subscripts superscripts and so on um, I do to some extent but um, I leave it so it's interactive so that's the point this is going to be interactive so the first thing we want to do here is let's calculate um, total returns and so a total return is made up of two components it's made up of a capital gain component and that's the price appreciation or depreciation a change in price we'll use a stock as an example this would apply a total return will apply to a stock it'll apply to a bond it'll apply to a to a, an apartment building so you buy an apartment building and you manage it for manage it for a while well you probably will have a capital gain or loss on the value of the property over time okay and then you're going to have um, some type of cash flow yield and so with an apartment building it would be your income from the rental units minus your expenses and that would be your cash flow so your total return would be made up of capital gains plus a cash flow yield with a stock the cash flow yield is a dividend yield so when you buy a stock a common stock you're going to get a capital gain and and you're going to have possibly dividend yields not all stocks pay dividends but uh, so this would be just zero if that's the case and all you'd have is capital gains and losses but in any case it's extremely important to keep in mind total returns not just the capital gain component which is what a lot of people focus on but both in the sum and so let's calculate that in terms of a return so we're going to say a percentage return here and we're going to say the price in period one minus the price in period zero divided by the price at time zero plus the dividend at period one divided by the price at time zero now what the heck is this well here's the timeline so we, I'll draw timelines throughout the semester we're going to start here at time zero and we're investing like itty bitty little point right before that time zero right here okay and so we're going to invest this is our, our investment horizon this is the time period that we're looking at we're looking at a return now I use I like to say annually because this and th that this is one year but it could be one month it could be technically it could be two years but it gets confusing it's it's 
much simpler to think of this in terms of a year. And we'll convert back and forth when we want to look at things at less than a year, and that'll be coming up soon. But what we're doing is we're investing at the stock right here, the stock at time zero. That's why there's a subscript there. And then we're going to look at the price at time one. That's associated with this time period. And so that's the price right before period one happens. So this is exactly one period apart. And then we're going to have a dividend that comes in at period one. So that's when we assume the dividend comes in. And so we have the capital gains component and the dividend yield component. Now, if you want to measure the returns in dollars, it's going to be the top part of this fraction. It's going to be P1 minus P0. That'll be your capital gain or loss plus your dividend income. So that's going to be the appreciation in terms of dollars that you get. Sometimes it's important to look at what the return is in dollars, but more often and most of the time in this course, we're looking at returns. And the reason we're looking at returns is because they're automatically adjusted, scaled for the investment. So this was your investment at the beginning of the period. So you want to put it in percent so then we can compare all sorts of investments that are unequal size. And that's why we have returns. So now let's actually do an example. And again, the example is going to show up right in the notes. So I'm not going to ref you know, keep showing you the notes here. So you're going to have to realize that, look, I'm following notes. And so I'm going to cover an example here. Suppose you bought General Electric stock for $25, held the stock for three months. Your holding period is three months. And so that's a term that shows up in a lot of investment textbooks and in investment contexts, like a holding period. Okay, so we go from zero to time one. This happens to be a three-month period. And so it's asking at the end of these three months, the stock trades at $30. So right here, it trades at $30. We bought it for 25 and then it says, look, it paid a $2 dividend, and we're going to assume that it paid a $2 dividend right here. So now the question is, compute your capital gain, your dividend income, and your total return in dollars and percent. Well, in percent, it's going to be 30 minus 25. You have a $5 capital gain divided by 25, the price you paid. That's 20% capital gain. The dividend yield is 2 divided by the 25. And you got 8% on this stock in terms of a dividend yield, which, by the way, is really, really high. Most stocks don't that, that do pay dividends don't pay near as high as 8%. But this is just an example. And you get 0.28 or 28% return. Most of it came from capital gains. Now, in terms of a... Oops, I should put this little r here if you want to calculate the dollar return well we have it right here you're going to make five dollars on the stock seven dollars for your return okay moving right along let's look at returns over time and so when i use returns over time i'm using some of the data that's in the book and usually in the first chapter of every investment textbook is a whole series of returns for different assets. So you get an idea how, how big some of those returns are, how variable those returns are, and also to use as examples in problems. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick returns from 2009 to 2012 out of the table. And those returns that I'm going to use, I'm going to use this in a number of examples moving forward the return in 2009 was 26.46 percent good good return for the stock market above average for that particular year we came right out of the great recession so it's not unusual the market dropped significantly and it rebounded then in 2010 it was 15.06 you know slightly above average the average ballpark is around 12 percent return for the, say, the S&P 500 over the past 80 years. You'll often hear that in this course. Then in 2011, it was only 2.11%. And then in 2012, it was 16%. So I'm going to use these numbers. Now, we can calculate an arithmetic average return, which is what you're used to. You just add these numbers up, divide by N. So sigma 
R. So these are all returns. And these are total returns that are listed in the book. The textbook is consistent. We're consistent in investments. So we almost always, when we almost always talk about returns, they're, they're usually total returns. So we take these sum of these total returns divided by M. That turns out to be about 14.91%. So the average return after the Great Recession was slightly above average. Okay, now we're looking at a total return, the, the simple return that basically what we had calculated earlier. This, that's what that's what how each one of these returns was calculated this way for each particular year. Now what we want to do is we want to look at compound average returns, CAR or geometric returns. And the reason why we want to do that is this does not reflect compounding. This is just a mathematical average. But in finance, money compounds. So if you start out with a, a dollar amount here, it doesn't increase like this. It goes up like this. And once it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this it, it, there's like a snowball effect. So you start out with a small snowball and you roll it on the ground and it picks up more snow. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so there's a cumulative effect. It's not going to be a nice linear relationship. So what we're going to do is we're going to capture that compounding effect in what's called a compound average return or geometric average return. And that return is calculated over time as one plus the return in period one. So you can think of this as period one. So it'd be um, R would be in decimal form 0.2646 and so on. And I'll do the calculations in a second. And so if there's n periods, you'd multiply these out one plus the returns each period. It's called a gross return in a sense because a gross return says, look, if you started out with a dollar, right, and you multiply this by 1.2646, for example, so you started out at the beginning of 2009 at a dollar, you're going to end up with a dollar 26. Okay, so um, you can think of this as a gross return. This is one. This is the re your investment plus 26 percent that you gained for that particular year. That's what each one of these things are doing here. Okay, and then what we want to do is we want to take an, a an average of that. Well, when we took an average arithmetically, we just divided by n. But when you multiply things out and you want to divide that or effectively divide it, you take it to the 1 over n power. And then we subtract 1 and we'll get a return in decimal form. So applied to the problem at hand, 1 plus 0.2646. we get this 1 over 4 minus 1. So this in big brackets with the 1 over 4 power, this is the average. And it turns out that this average turns out to be 1.1458. Okay, that's what this comes out to be. And what it says is, look, you've made on average 14 and a half percent, almost about 14.6 percent on average each of these years reflecting compounding. So that's the average of these numbers right here. It's pretty close to the arithmetic. Usually the geometric or compound average return will be slightly less okay, than the, than the, the arithmetic. And it's nothing but an average. So if you didn't have a calculator, this would be a really good way. You can nearly eyeball this, right? Or just in, in, to, in order to come up with the geometric average. But the geometric average is more precise. I mean, that's what we used and you used in your basic financial management course, the prerequisite. Somehow, some way, you've employed this when you looked at the time value of money and you looked at compounding of money and you calculated stock and bond prices. It reflected this. So the question becomes, what happens if you invest $100 in, in the stock market beginning of 2009? So you invest $100, 2009, call that time zero, and here's 2009. 
So we're going to drop in $100 in this 2010, 2011, and then 2012 at the end. So you got 26%, 15%, 2 and 16 If you invest $100, what are you going to get back here? Well, you can always think of this here as um, putting a... You could put a dollar in front of this, by the way, and it doesn't do anything because when you multiply by a dollar, it's just one. So if we take this, right? What happened, what that's saying is, look, we're taking a dollar, we're, we're compounding at 26%, then on top of that, we're compounding at 15%, and on top of all this, we're compounding at 2%, on top of all this, we're compounding at 16%. You know what we end up with? We'd end up with a dollar seventy-two thirty-six. So it's a dollar seventy-two thirty-six, and if you started out with a hundred dollars, this would be a hundred and seventy-two dollars and thirty-six cents. And so this whole thing equals 1.7236, this whole compounding thing. Okay, so let's move on. Let's move on to effective average returns. So investors often want to see returns annualized. And not only investors, but even the government wants to see returns annualized. So when you look at, for example, returns discussed in expense rates and interest rates that are associated with credit cards and loans, it's often required that those loans be, that those interest rates be presented on an annual basis. And the reason for that is in the past, many banks and financial institutions confused consumers because you'd have one institution saying, look, here's our interest rate and it only applied to you know one month. And then they'd give you another interest rate, another bank, another interest rate. You know, this is a six-month period, and, and this one is a nine-month period, and this one's a one-year period, and this one's a two-and-a-half-year period, and you got totally confused. And so if annualizing, displaying returns on an annual basis is extremely important for comparative purposes, and that's what we want to do here. We want to make sure we can have returns that we can compare easily because that's what investors do. They want to look at what's the best risk and return trade-off. We haven't gotten the return risk yet, but we'll get to it. But they want to look at what's the best return. So look at everything annualized. So let me jump right, jump right into the formula and then we can discuss it. So effective annualized return is 1 plus the holding period return, right? The and that's nothing but, it's basically telling you, be careful of the time period in which you're calculating that return. And so that's what the holding period return is. we got to keep our eye on that. And M is the number of holding periods in a year, which you'll see better in an example. But for now, if, you, if this period right here, this holding period return, this is a return for six months, say, then there's two six-month periods. If this is the return for a quarter of a year, this will be four. And if this is the return for a week, this would be 52. And if this is a return for one year, this would be a one. So let's actually apply this to the problem we looked at a few minutes ago. And that was this problem, where we had a stock that went from 25 to 30, paid a $2 dividend. So we know it's a, it's a total return. And so we're going to take one plus that 28% return that we generated there. And remember, according to this problem, this was for a three month period. See that? Right there. Three month period. So, how many three month periods are there in a year? Well, there's four. So we subtract one and we come up with 1.684. And that kind of looks weird. It looks weird to me a bit. But what we've done is we've taken 28% on a quarterly basis, three-month basis, extrapolated out. We got over 100% return. And so this is 168.4%. Now, that's an extraordinary return for a year. 
But here's the point of looking at these effective annual returns. We annualize it. That's the, that's the important thing. But be very, very careful about it because what we've done is we extrapolated it out. And what I mean by that is, look, we have a whole year here and we went a quarter of a year, a half a year, three quarters of a year. And this is three month period, right? And that was 28%. And then what we did was we said we got 28% here, we got 28% here, we got 28% here. And so we took it, take it to the fourth power, we'd end up with 168%. Okay. So, I mean, that is mathematically the right way to do it. But the problem is, intuitively, we've extrapolated a really high return. Because you can get a high return on any given quarter of a year, a week, or a day. I mean, you can make this on a day. Let's say on a day, you happen to get a 5% return. Well, 1.05 to the 365th power minus one is gigantic. So the problem is, you you know, you got a 5% return in one day. Your chances of getting a 5% return for the next, for every day, the next 364 days is nearly zero. So you need to be careful when you're looking at these effective annualized returns. So it solves one problem in a sense, um, but it can create other problems with the extrapolation. Now we also want to look at re real returns. And real returns are simply the return that you get. So it's your total return minus an inflation estimation. So for a particular year. So if we look at 2011, the return for 2011 was 2.11%. The inflation rate was 2.96, about 3%. And so what we did was we actually lost purchasing power of you know, almost 1%. Okay. So that's what this is. This, this captures your gain in purchasing power from this investment. The investment paid off 2.11% for the year. That was your total return in the stock market. But the economy prices started ate away in other words, prices rose at 3%. So you actually, from this investment, you didn't even keep up with the, the price of inflation because you know, if you cash this investment in at the end of the year to buy goods and services, it buys about 1% less goods and services. So real returns, again, are, are important because it's what investors really earn. It's what you can get in terms of purchasing power so we want to often back out the illusion that inflation causes, and that's what you're seeing here. Now, let's move over here. Let's calculate another type of, of return, and that's a risk premium. A risk premium. It's the additional return investors expect to receive by taking on additional amounts of risk. So basically what we say is, see is we have returns for... You, this could be for a stock or a bond, and that's going to equal a risk-free rate plus some type of risk premium. Okay, So if you had an investment like a treasury bill or a treasury bond that had no risk, it was risk-free, and we're talking about default risk here, then this would go away and all you'd earn is the risk-free rate because there's no risk associated. This would be zero. Now, if you buy a stock, you're going to get this risk-free rate of return because it covers the opportunity cost of money and you want to account for that so you know if, if interest rates in general in the economy are five percent then you're going to get five percent plus you better get something in addition to that because you're taking risk and if you're risk adverse you'd never buy something that had a return from a risky asset that was less than the risk-free rate it wouldn't make sense You'd be gambling with your money effectively, taking risk with your money, and getting a return less than or equal to the risk-free rate. You wouldn't want to do that. So the more risk you take, the more risk premium you want. So let's just look at the effect, the equity risk premium. And equity, and so there could be an equity risk premium, there could be a bond risk premium, depend on the asset you're looking at. Let's look at the equity risk premium associated with large stocks. So equity meaning we're looking at the stock market, and in particular the return on large company stocks minus the risk-free rate. Okay, so that's 
just rearranging this, taking this return, and we're subtracting the risk-free rate to come up with this risk premium. And if you look at 2011, so I'm using the 2011 example, the return was 2.11, and the risk-free rate was really low. It was basically zero. So notice that's 0.06%. So in decimal form, it's 0 0.0006. It's almost zero because after the Great Recession, the, the central bank, the Fed, flooded the money, uh, the economy with, with money because we had a liquidity crisis. And if you want to get rid of a liquidity crisis, you put a lot of liquidity out there. And that drove interest rates down because the supply of money increased. And remember, interest rates are the price of money. And so if you increase the supply tremendously, then prices come down just like you know price of apples if you if you increase the supply of apples tremendously then the price of apples will drop close to zero so that's what's going on here and so when we do this calculation we get about 2.5 percent risk premium that in other words in the year 2011 we earned about two percent for investing in large company stocks just because of risk Now, let's move on. We're talking about risk. We've got to calculate risk. We spend a lot of time in this course calculating risk and discussing risk. And so risk is the chance of an actual return from an investment that differs from what's expected. What's expected? This guy is what's expected because that's an average. Remember, when you did statistics, you, know, you talked about Here's returns, here's your average return. What do you expect in terms of probability? You expect R bar. So volatility, variance, is what we're going to use in standard deviation to measure risk. And that basically it says, and if you recall from basic statistics, is if you have a very wide distribution, right, then your, your chance your stock's going to be way above average, way below average, is, you know, fairly high probability. If you had a very small standard deviation, that's not very good, but to pretend that's a very narrow distribution, uh, assume it's symmetrical, then your standard deviation is going to be small and you're going to have small risk. So here you can deviate from what's expected hugely. Here you can hardly deviate from what's expected. And if you invest in the risk-free rate, then you basically have that distribution, which is not really a distribution, it's just a point. What you see is what you're going to get. That's going to be the risk-free rate, which equals the average risk-free rate over the next year, say. Okay, so remember, risk-free rates that you get from the Wall Street Journal and nearly any website, these guys will be on an annual basis. So let's get back to the story and let's calculate the variance. And the variance is going to be the return in period one minus the average squared and so what we're, what we're doing here is well let me let me write it out here and then I'll show you graphically oops it's one two three missing one What I'm doing is I'm taking the returns from their mean, okay, these deviations, like from here to here or from here to here, for example, squaring them and adding them up and dividing by n minus 1. It's basically taking an average of the squared deviations. You've got to subtract n minus 1 for that degree of freedom adjustment. You get, if you recall in statistics, and that minus 1 is the fact that we're using additional information to calculate this. We're using this R bar. So don't worry about that detail. Just recognize that your variance is nothing but an average is a squared deviation. It's a slightly funny average because normally you think as an average is being in. Okay, so there we have it. But what's going on here? So your returns vary over time. It's this, 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 this graph. Oops. On its side, basically. And so you would have an average. Right, so you have an average over time. Here's your average, and it deviates. So you can put a, 
distribution around that for probability. Chances of it being way up here or low, way down here or low, but the chances are it keeps crossing, keeps crossing, keeps crossing. It's going to be close to the mean. Okay? But you're going to have, um, you're going to obviously have numbers that are way up and way low. And so that's what this variance is capturing, how wiggly it is. So if you have a risk-free rate, this guy, there's no wiggle. The line just moves like this over time. So here I'm going over time. Now, if you have really risky stocks like the NASDAQ, um, which is um, a hot, you know, mainly tech stocks, then it's going to be highly volatile, highly risky, because you could be losing a lot of money down here. So that's why it's risky. So the more volatile the stock is, the less you can sleep, the higher its variance. And if we want to calculate standard deviation to get back into original units, because these units are squared returns, which are hard to interpret. We're going to use them occasionally, but they're hard to interpret. So if we take the square root of the variance, we get back into something that's in percent, because this is basically percent squared. And so I, I don't, you're not going to see that anywhere except from me, but I like to sometimes highlight the fact that we're not in original units here. We're in returns squared, so percent percent to, to highlight that. And then when you just see 1% sign, you know you're back into original units, which are generally plain old returns. So let's actually calculate the variance of returns given the example oops, of information data from 2011 to 2012. It's going to be 26.46 is the return in 2009 minus the 14.91 average. Now remember, this is what we calculated way back here. So remember, we calculated this average 14.91%. So that's the average arithmetic average here, not the geometric average because the, the arithmetic average is what you can do, what you can use with statistics for normal distribution and standard deviations. And so this doesn't work with a geometric average. These are arithmetics. Okay, so we're going to average them over three. We had four, one, two, three, four. We're going to subtract one for that degree of freedom adjustment. And then we end up with um, this being 99.49 as a variance. But, you know, and that's percent percent. And, you know, that's really hard to interpret. I look at that, it doesn't have much meaning to me. But we take the square root, the standard deviation of the returns is 9.97, it's about 10%. Okay, so remember what we're doing here. Again, if you go out one standard deviation, which is basically what we calculated, so this was 14.91, this is R. If we go up one standard deviation returns, this is 9.97, so you'd add 9.97, you'd be basically at 24.88. And then if you subtracted 9.97 on this side, we'd be at 4.94%. And so 68% of the time, our returns should be between these two numbers, between almost 25% and about 5%. We should be in there because remember, this is 34% of a normal distribution. And then you can go out two standard deviations in fact, if we went out two standard deviations, this would be a negative return. This would be nearly 35% out here. Okay? And then we would have um, all that would be left is 2.5% here. If you can read that, 2.5% here. So that means 95% of the time you'd be in these two numbers right here. Okay? So... That's basically review statistics and how to, how to approach that. Now what we want to do is look, we've calculated risk, we've calculated return, 
let's assemble it into a thing called risk adjusted returns because that's what investors care about what's the interaction and the trade-off between risk and return we've just calculated these things kind of in isolation so there's a there is a method a formula for calculating risk adjusted returns and they're often the, the label for that is often s because this is invented by a guy named bill sharp who's a nobel laureate in finance and he invented this and this is risk adjusted returns and we're going to talk about this all semester uh, because this is what really matters returns that are adjusted for the amount of risk and the reason for that is if you have let's say you got one two three four five portfolio managers right and you're looking at the returns and the ones that invest in almost no risk let's say they get a one percent return and these guys take a little more risk because they're in different type of assets that they specialize maybe it's three percent maybe this is five percent maybe this is nine percent and maybe this is twenty percent on average you would expect them to earn a higher rate of return okay but how do you know given the additional risk that this is the proper amount of compensation for that this return is enough compensation for the additional risk that these guys are taking this formula will scale this so that everybody's on an equal playing field because this is going to be adjusted by a high amount of risk so we're going to divide this by a big number we're going to divide this by a slightly smaller number but it's still going to be big we're going to divide this by eh, something probably in the middle and this is going to be divided by small numbers and when we get this done we're done with this we're going to adjust this so everybody's on a playing field level playing field because you've extracted or eliminated the risk component and you looked at oh did this return really generate an above average rate of return given the risk that's what we're looking for here the formula for this is you're going to take the return on your portfolio and you're going to subtract out the risk-free rate and these are averages so you have a portfolio and you're going to calculate the equity risk premium that's basically what we just looked at a few minutes ago on average over a period of time and we're going to divide it by the sigma of the portfolio where this is nothing but remember from statistics that's the standard deviation right and it's what is the standard deviation of it's a standard deviation of returns the returns from your portfolio so look it's backing out the opportunity to cost the money right here and saying look this is your risk premium this is the extra return you got for risk so if we go from here to here you got extra return for risk this difference and is that enough to given the risk for a, a, a good compensation amount that's what this is getting at so let me get a clean piece of paper actually with this problem because there's going to be a number of calculations and so here's the setup for the problem it says your portfolio balance started out over the past several weeks has been a million dollars and then it goes from a million dollars to a million twenty yeah one million and twenty thousand and then it goes back down to a million then it goes down to nine hundred eighty thousand and then up to one million and forty thousand okay and then it tells us to annual risk-free rate and so it even tells you that it's an annual risk-free rate and I just clarify that that it is but most of the time you're going to see this in print or you're going to hear it talked about on the on the television it's going to be they're just going to assume it's like here's the risk-free rate it's annualized so it's a half a percent okay now it says the question is compute and interpret risk adjusted returns for your portfolio okay now the hint is to make sure that all your returns are on a weekly basis because it went from a million right to a million twenty thousand right that was over a one week period then it went back down to a million dollars that was that's a comma there these are weekly numbers okay so we want to make sure that our returns are all on the same basis so let's let's do the problem so here we got a balance we're going to look at returns we need to calculate returns right to do risk adjusted returns you need returns one of the big mistakes is students take these balances and try to risk adjust them 
It's risk-adjusted returns, not risk-adjusted balances. Okay. okay, so then let's keep moving. We're going to look at the deviations from the mean. What's, what's that telling you? That mean, That's telling you we're going to calculate risk because we're looking at deviations around the mean. So we start off with um, a, a million dollars. I'm not going to write out all these zeros because it doesn't matter. So save yourself a lot of time. And so um, we start out at the beginning with a million dollars. You can't calculate the return because we don't know what the balance was beforehand. So we can't calculate these two numbers. Then we have a million twenty thousand, and that represents a two percent return, right? So you can work that by hand, but you can see with your eye, you can chop off two, another set of zeros, and you can see it went from 100 to 102. It's basically two percent. And what's the deviation from the mean? Well, I'll give it to you right now, but you don't know where that's coming from. This average, I'm going to calculate that average here in a second. Okay, so give me a second. Let me write this out. So there's our portfolio balances. Here we lost about 1.96%. You know, we went back to, this, to where we ended up, but notice. When you start with a higher number, your return is a little bit lower, um, at least on an absolute basis, because you started out with a higher number. Then here we did, we lost 2%. And here we made a nice 6.12% for that week. These are all weeks. This adds up to 4.16 divided by 4, and you get an arithmetic average. This is our bar for this period on your portfolio, by the way. This is your R bar for your portfolio. And so that's where the 1.04 is coming in. We're going to square the deviation from there, and this will come out to be 0.92. And then we're going to do the same calculation here. Add this up. So we're going to add up the square deviations, which is basically this is it's the same thing we did right here, except I did this going out horizontally, kind of. Here, just doing it vertically, and I'm going to take sum this up. This will be 44.97. That's percent percent, by the way, divided by four minus one, which is three. And the variance is going to be 14.99 percent percent. That's VAR. And we're going to take the square root of this, and we're going to get the standard deviation of returns for your portfolio, or which often is labeled as sigma p. Okay, that's if you remember from statistics, your standard deviation was sigma p, and it was sigma squared, p, oh, just sigma. You didn't look at portfolios in investment management in in, in statistics, <laughs> so get rid of the little get rid of this little guy right here, the P's, and that, and you see sigmas in statistics all over the place, and this will be 3.87 percent. Okay, so that's, you know under four percent volatility for a given week. So that's sometimes what we call volatility. So volatility can refer to variance. Or it can refer to its standard deviate to the standard deviation, which is the square root of error. So when you hear volatility, what you should be thinking is this: not necessarily a particular measure, but the more volatile you are, that's volatility. And so um, our sharp ratio, which is risk-adjusted returns, is going to be the average minus ooh. We gotta get an average risk-free rate. So remember I told you the risk-free rate in this problem was a half a percent, but that's on an annual basis. That's the way it's disclosed so everybody can compare. You know, because you have, for example, you have a treasury yield curve, which is the interest rate on, on government securities, and you have government securities that go one month, you have some that go three months, some six months, some nine months, some a year, some all the way to 30 years. Now, how are you going to compare all those returns? Well, that goes back to the story of 
if you annualize it, then you can say, okay, the annual return on average of 30 years is going to be a certain percent. And then you can compare it down all the way down to a one month that you've adjusted to reflect that. So it's annualized, it's comparable. So this will be um, 0.5 divided by 52, because it's 52 weeks in a year. That comes out to 0.00962. It's almost zero. You'd need a microscope to see that. So it really doesn't have much of an effect. And 3.87. So this is the world we live in today. We live in a world where the interest rates are really, really low because the, we've, the Fed has pumped up the money supply pushed interest rates down. So you remember a story, maybe you remember it from economics. This is interest rates. This is the quantity of money out there. And so you have money demand and you have money supply and the Fed increased the money supply. And so you can see interest rates come down tremendously as that supply increases. Just like the supply of anything goes up, then prices go down and interest rates are the price of money. This turns out to be 0.263. Now, this is not measured in any particular unit, so students love to put a percent sign behind here. So I'll put it behind here and I'll go like this. You don't want to do that. Because this is percent divided by a percent. Right? Because this is a percent. This is a percent. This is a percent. So when you divide percent by percent you don't have it's not in percent the percents basically cancel out okay if you have something in dollars and you divide it by dollars the dollar signs cancel out so that kind of makes sense so you got these units and so the point is here what I'm trying to get at is this is dimensionalless it doesn't have a particular set of units and all you do in order to evaluate this is who the 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 portfolio manager with the highest risk adjusted return, this number, when they calculate it, has the highest performance because we're looking at how much extra return we're getting. Here's the risk, equity risk premium in this example. This is all equity. And we're dividing by the standard deviation. We're looking at how much extra return per standard deviation we're getting, how much risk premium per unit of standard deviation. I think that's the way to say it clearly. Okay how much risk premium you get per standard deviation. And the higher you get, the better it is. And so, in, in our, we often play stock track and in, in any given semester in, in uh, investment management. And so what I'm gonna do is we're gonna calculate the, these returns for your portfolios. It's, it's, it's not an accident that these numbers kinda look like the million dollars you get in stock track, right? Start off with a million, Maybe one week you did really good and you got 20,000 and then it dropped down. You're like, ugh. And then it sinks down even more and only rebounds. And so you can calculate the returns, calculate the risk, put it all into one calculation. And now I can compare student A to student B to student C and see who at the end of the semester gets the highest risk adjusted return. So imagine this going for 15 weeks all the way down. Do the calculations over 15 weeks calculating this and the student with the highest risk adjusted return well you know usually gets bonus points at the end of the semester somehow some way and so um, that's how it works and by the way you think of yourselves as portfolio managers in the real world portfolio managers they need to be compensated and the best portfolio managers on a risk adjusted basis are the ones that are going to be compensated the most so my point is this, you know, you can have people who invest in money market securities and we'll get to what they are later, but they're really low risk securities. But these are what the, these portfolio managers, they have to buy these things because that's what they're obligated to do. They're supposed to manage portfolios of money market securities, low risk, low return. And there's other people who manage securities that have higher amounts of risk. So if you're, getting a bonus based on your returns, right? So how well you perform, well, these guys are always going to outperform these guys on average, not in any particular year, but on average over the long run, these guys are gonna way outperform. 
there's no reason why these guys should be getting compensated in the long run multiple times more than these guys. So what you do is you put everybody on the same playing field by calculating the risk-adjusted returns here. Another way of saying it is that we have all the students here, five students, they all manage por different portfolios. One takes a low amount of risk, another one takes a little more, and the fifth student takes a whole bunch of risk. Well, of course, you would expect on average that the person who took a lot of risk to earn a greater rate of return. But when you divide it out by the standard deviation here, everybody's on the same playing field. Okay, enough said with that. Let's move on to dollar weighted returns. Yeah, so dollar weighted returns, I'm going to abbreviate them dollar weighted returns are exactly what it says. It's the returns that are weighted by dollars. So in the past, if we calculate the return of say 3% and then one time we get 5% and another time we get 2 percent right and we add this up and divide by three we've given every return an equal weight right but that doesn't always make sense when you're managing portfolios you can't give everything an equal weight because everything didn't get an equal rate the return you got depended on how much money you had invested in your portfolio at any given time so that's what dollar weighted returns are trying to get at so let's jump into an example to see how this works. So we're going to have year. And we're going to have cash flow. CF cash flow at the end of the period. And then we're going to have an, um, a period return. Let's call it R. And then I'll just put a description here so we're clear on how things work because it's a little confusing when you do this. Um, it, it makes a lot of sense, but the signs are going to flip around, so it may confuse you. So here's what's going to happen. At the end of period zero, okay, so you can think of this timeline. The end of period zero, right here, you're going to put in $5,000. And it's going to be an initial, it's going to have a negative sign in here because it's, you're taking money, say, out of your pocket and you're putting it into this investment. So you're sinking money into this investment. And then at the end, you're going to get money back that's going to go back into your pocket and that money is positive, has a positive sign. So you sink this into the investment and you get a, hopefully a nice decent amount at the end. And you'll see that in this example. And so that's, that's how the signs work. When you deal with this in your calculator, your calculator needs to know that. It's either this is going to be a negative and this is going to be a big positive, or you could actually reverse the signs and say this is positive because you're putting an investment in and then you're going to withdraw. It's confusing, I know, but just be consistent with the signs. I'm going to assume that an investment in this is taking money out of your pocket and you're sinking five grand into this. Okay, so this happens right at the end of this time period, and then you have period one. In period one, there's a return of 3%. So 3% in this time period. But what happened was um, we withdraw, and that means we're, a withdrawal means you're, you're taking $1,000 out and you're putting it in your pocket. So your pocket just increased, the money in your pocket just went up by 1000 bucks. And I'll call that a withdrawal, just W-I-T-H. And then we're going to make a deposit. And during this re period, we're going to lo lose 8%. So this is an additional investment here. And then we're going to take $9,000 out and we'll have no balance left. So we've sunk in. 5,000, we withdrew 1,000, and we added an additional 3,000, and then at the end, we withdrew $9,000 because we got a 32% return 
in this last period we did really well 32 percent return for that particular year this was minus eight percent return now the question is compute the dollar weighted return before we calculate the dollar weighted return your arithmetic return would treat each of these returns equally so you would just add these up and divide by three okay, that would be your arithmetic average you can calculate the compound average return of this, which would be 1.03 times 1.92, oh, because 1 minus 0.08 is 0.92, times 1.32, and take it to the one-third power. That would be your compound average return. Okay, And that, again, applies an equal. The compound average return is, is applying equal weight to every one of these returns. But look what we need to, to consider we have a different dollar amount invested at any given time and so these returns need to be weighted by how much of investment we have so before we go further let's actually see how how we how we calculate this nine thousand dollars so we had five thousand dollars to start with and that earned a three percent return so we had fifty one fifty at the end with this one with this five thousand here how much should we have right here? Well, we had 5150, but we have to subtract out the $1,000 that we withdrew. So we have 5150 minus 1,000, right? And that's going to get a minus 8% return. And that means we have 3818. So I'm just really, I'm going through here and calculating the balance and how it grew or detracted over time given the returns and given the changes in the dollar amounts. And so then here at the end of 2000, or no, the end of year two, there we pull out $3,000. Oh, we add $3,000. Be careful of that sign. And so we have thirty-eight. 18 plus three thousand dollars and that's going to earn 32 percent so whoo look at that we're good we made that three thousand dollar investment just before we had a 32 percent return Ooh, that's great that's good timing so that comes out to be um eight nine 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 point seven six basically nine thousand dollars i got some rounding in there and so that's how we recompute the nine thousand dollars we got okay so now you can look at it another way and ask what did we get on average what is this average return here this return or you know here what did we get on average considering it's weighted by these dollar amounts that's what the dollar weighted return is going to be and it's almost impossible to calculate what that average return is by hand and that's where the concept of internal rate of return and your calculator comes into play. If you remember from your basic financial management course, you calculated internal rate of return. And that comes out to be internal rate of return pops out a percent. We're talking about a percentage. And it basically tells you what is the, what is the average rate of return showing up here. And the way to do that is is the idea that you want to in input these numbers into your calculator and the reason why I'm jumping right through a calculator is because you can't compact calculate the internal rate of return which is the same oops, which is the same as the internal rate of dollar weighted return and internal rate of return are the same thing you can't calculate these things by hand especially when you go you can do it for one or for two periods for example you can do it, but once you get over three periods and four periods, you can't do it by hand. It's mathematically impossible to do it. So you go into your calculator. So you get a calculator, TA plus, uh, BA plus, Texas Instruments thing, where you can use, see this little thing right here? Maybe you can't see it. This little CF button, cash flow, right? And so what I want to do is I'm going to put in cash flow of five. I'm going to chop the zeros off. Don't bother with the zeros. You'll get the same answer. So here, uh, cash flow one will equal plus one. Cash flow two is equal to minus three. And cash flow three 
is equal to nine. So we dropped in, in other words, we invested 5,000, pulled 5,000 out of our pocket, then we put $5,000 back into our pocket because we made the withdrawal, and we added another 3,000, we ended up with 9,000, we liquidate the investment. So that's the concept. That's why there's a positive sign there. And so when you calculate, input this into your calculator, so you hit cash flow, and I already have it in here because I worked the problem out earlier. You hit cash flow and you put five, I'll put five in there, enter, come down, uh, you put one, enter, three with a minus sign, enter, and then you hit nine, enter, because it's a positive, and then you want to make sure you want to do these arrows here to make sure there's nothing further along, that there's no cash flows out here that you left out, you left, it's left over from a previous problem, because you could forget that. It's going to include those in the calculation. So notice I'm looking at C cash flows for pre or future periods. There are none. It's all zeroed out because I zeroed it out. Okay, so we, en we entered these cash flows in. And we're going to say compute IRR. And what do you know? It's going to pop out 11.33%. And that's your dollar weighted return. And your calculator is going to blink a little bit if you look at it carefully. Often, especially if you have a long row of numbers here, you're going to, it's going to blink, which means your calculator is actually doing trial and error. Like I said, there's no mathematical formula for calculating this or that can be solved. You can write the formula out, but you can't solve it. Uh, you got to solve it by trial and error and it's exactly what your calculator is doing behind the scenes it's doing a trial and error thing until it finds the interest rate that sets all these cash flows to the point where they're a function of the, of the weights that are invested yeah so notice we have these cash flows right and all I did was I inputted the cash flows I didn't put the returns in there just the cash flows and I ended up with 9,000. So what is the interest rate that makes this happen for me to accumulate to $9,000? Well, we saw that it's three, it's minus eight, it's 32%, but what's the average of these? It's 11.33%. How do we know? We can verify it. Let me show you. If you take the $5,000 and you compound that out three periods, okay, let me show you here, $5,000, compound it one, two, three periods, at that percent, you'll get six, eight, nine, 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 I have trouble reading my own writing, right? And then I'm going to lose. So I had 5,000, but I took 1,000 out. And that 1,000 is not going to earn the 11.33% for two periods because I took it out. I took $1,000 out right here. And so this 1,000, it's not going to earn that 11% in these two periods. That's what the two stands for. So this comes out to be minus 1, 2, 3, 9, 44. And then I'm going to put in 3,000 more at 1.133 to the 1 power because right here I'm going to put in that $3,000 additional investment and it's going to earn interest 32% over that one year. Okay, But I'm losing averages here. So this comes out to be 333990. And I end up with eight nine 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 seventy nine. Again, I'm off by you know like twenty cents in rounding. Okay. So, cash flows, an average return based on these cash flows gives us our ending balance. Now we're done with the calculations at this point. If you had trouble following me and using the calculator for dollar weighted returns. 
Keep in mind that my notes detail exactly what you need to press for buttons and how the concepts work. And it's not just for dollar weighted returns. If you look at my notes, you'll find a lot of extra detail that I may not have covered in the video that will help fill in some, some missing pieces for you. Now what I want to do with this dollar weighted return is one more thing. What I want to do is give you a little insight into its practical application. And here's how it goes. Generally, you have portfolio managers in the world, and a portfolio manager just doesn't sit there and manage money for an individual. Professional money managers often manage million and billion dollar funds, or, you know, portfolios of securities. And the owners, the actual owners of those securities, there literally could be thousands of investors. And so these investors basically submit their money for portfolio managers to professionally managed. So the portfolio managers professionally buy and sell securities. They figure out what to buy, what to sell. And so basically the investors, the individuals say like you and I, we turn our all that responsibility over to the professional manager. Now, how does that tie into um, the returns and dollar weighted returns and the geometric slash compound average returns that we talked about in this video. Well, here's how it goes. If you want to evaluate a portfolio manager, the best thing you can do is evaluate his or her performance is to use compound average returns or ge what we call geometric average returns. And the reason for that is it treats the returns each period equally. There's no reason the dollar adjust, okay? so because the portfolio manager is just managing a portfolio, and and people who who do the accounting for the fund for the for the portfolio will keep track of what's going on. But now, what about the return that the investor gets? How should you calculate that? Now, normally you would think, well, okay, it should be the geometric or compound average return that the portfolio manager is facing. And, and, and is working off of and, and using. Not really, and the reason for it is this. The individual investors are making additions and withdrawals from their portfolios on a continuous basis. They're pooling money out one week and depositing in another, and each one of those investors needs to have a dollar-weighted return because as we just saw, how much money they invest in any particular week or any particular year ha has big implications. But the point is, the professional money manager who's managing the portfolio has no control on when investors pull money out and add money in. So you don't want to hold the portfolio manager accountable for those additions and deletions from the portfolio. Hence, you use an equal weighted return, which is the geometric return slash compound average return. So now what I want to do is take a brief, make a brief note on investment strategies. And it's important, you know, because you're going to read the textbook and listen to the news. You're going to hear there's like a, there's an infinite number of investment strategies out there. And what are the more common ones that make sense? And there's some that just don't make any sense. And by the time you're done with this course, Hopefully you can decipher which makes what makes sense and what doesn't. And that's part of what this course is designed to do, to get you familiar with it. Because, you know, in the real world, there's going to be people, they're going to be stockbrokers, they're portfolio managers, and their job is to sell you investments. And they, they're going to only tell you the good stuff about their investments. You know, they might refer to risk and stuff a little bit, but... They're, they're just going to tell you their strategy, and if you don't know any better, how can you argue with them? You say, oh, that sounds good, and so on. So the point is, throughout this course, you're going to be, you'll become professionally skeptical when people tell you about their performance in the stock market, because what you ought to do when they tell you their performance in the stock market is ask them, well, you know, what period are you talking about your returns? Are your returns... Um, are they for the last 10 years or did you just cherry pick a particular quarter or a particular week <laughs> or a particular year? Uh, so you got to make sure that it covers a long period of time and not cherry picking. And then you need to ask, well, what kind of stocks? Because, you know, if this 
person invests in highly risky stocks, you would expect on average to outperform the market. And if you're a conservative investor, well, you would expect lower rates of return. So you got to risk adjust. It's, you got to almost do that in your head without actually having numbers. So that's another question you should ask. And then you might ask, well, how do you out, how do you actually pick these stocks? And, and so um, there's a bunch of questions you should be asking, and that's what this course is going to help you formulate those those questions. To to be professionally skeptical is important in the investment world because, like I said, everybody's trying to sell you their strategy and make themselves look good. So what are some of the strategies that are out there that kind of make sense, but you need to look at these each one of these a little more closely when you're actually implementing it. So one is value investing. This is really common. Value investing. And that's the goal here is the, the individuals is looking for stocks that are cheap in value. Because if they're cheap in value now, they're going to appreciate in the future. So you're basically looking for cheap stocks, undervalued stocks. Okay? But in order to do this, you need to have some type of model or some good explanation on why you think those stocks are cheap or undervalued relative to what they should be. In other words, what you're saying here, and this is part of the professional skepticism part is, look, you're saying that these stocks, you're, you're looking for cheap bargain stocks. But what makes you think that they're cheap and bargain? But you're basically suggesting or implying that the stock market price of ABC stock, let's say it's at $50, you're saying that that $50 is low compared to what it ought to be. You're saying, well, maybe it ought to be worth $70. You're basically saying the entire stock market in the world of investing that's looking at this stock because people are scouring the markets every day with computers. Uh, they're evaluating the risk return. There are security analysts that evaluate this stock, ABC, whatever stock it is. And so basically you're saying that the market is, is off and you're right, that the rest of the world is wrong and you're right. And so you need to look at that carefully so that's, because that's what the implication of value investing. Now, that said, there are some people that can do that. Okay, but the, and the other thing you need to, to consider is, look, these things are risky stocks. And so you got to make sure that you've got the right risk in your mind when you're looking at value stocks. Because, look, if you buy stocks that are highly risky, of course they're going to be cheap. Because risky stocks have lower prices, and lower prices translate into higher returns. You're going to see this. And I'll show it as we go throughout the semester. But a lower price means a higher return. Because if you buy a stock cheap, right, the denominator, PO, is going to be low, which means you're going to earn a decent amount of return. You can think of this as P1 over P0 minus 1. Forget the, the dividend. That just complicates things. So when this is low, this whole thing, this return, will be high. So that's value investing. You got to, you're looking for cheap stocks, and you have some type of idea or model on how to make sure that stocks are cheap. I say make sure. You never really are sure until until the end, and you get out of the stock. Okay. Then there's growth investing. Growth investing is you don't care if the stock's over or undervalued. Really, what you're looking at is does this stock have a high growth rate? And a high growth rate, I don't mean necessarily the, the past. I'm saying future, because the value of any stock is the present value of its future cash flows, as you saw in your previous finance course, and we're going to go over time and again in this course. You're sitting here at time zero. You're buying a stock. The stock is based on the dividends in the future. It's technically not based on the, the past. Stocks are forward-looking. And so you're looking for stocks that, that where that dividend grows. And even if it doesn't pay a dividend now, it, it will pay in maybe dividend in year five. It'll pay a dividend. Okay, if it's a stock that doesn't pay dividends, but that dividend is going to be high. That's growth investing because stocks that have high growth in their cash flows means there's a high growth in their returns in the future. So that's growth investing. 
Say you want to look up startup companies, for example, uh, young tech companies, and you're focusing on the capital gain component of your return here. There's also timing strategies, which could mean almost anything, but it basically means, you know, somehow, some way, you know when to buy when the stock is low and when to sell when it's high. So you, you don't really care about the particular stock. You don't care if it's a value stock. You don't care if it's a growth stock. You simply don't care. You're saying, I can time the market on any stock, and that's you're just buying low and trying to sell high. There's dividend income strategies where you buy stocks that pay high amounts of dividends. And so what we're doing is taking, uh, taking a look at that total return component. And so these guys right here, especially this growth, especially this growth is looking for high capital gains. And a dividend strategy, dividend yield, that's just dividend yield just means that the dividend relative to the price is high. So the, and this is dollars and this is dollars. It's generating a high in return. So that's this cash flow component. If that's high, then what people like is the fact that, look, you know, dividends tend to be relatively stable through time. So this can be a relatively stable number, generate this D, which is in dollars right here. And then this, you know, this capital gain, that can be risky because sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, sometimes it's all over the map. And so, okay, this is all over the map for a period of time. You can always rely on getting this dividend because dividends tend to be stable, tend to be, not always, but tend to be stable. And so that's why people look at dividend income strategy. Plus it generates cash flow, a predictable amount of cash flow per share. There's also sector plays, which is investing in particular sectors. And so you might be into chip, you know, buying chip stocks or automobile stocks or uh, software stocks. And so that's sector plays. And so you have to have an idea that you know when sectors are going to do well. And typically what people do is they look at things over the business cycle. So you might want to look at, you know, if you're going to go in, down into an economic downturn, right? Maybe you want to go into stocks that are more generic, like a Walmart type deal, a Dollar General. And then when the and the economy is booming, you you know people move away from Walmart and Dollar General and start buying you know some high end retailers, you know more towards Target. And so that may be how you place sectors in various areas of the economy. Then there's also market strategies. And market strategies are, look, you know, you buy an individual stock, stock ABC, who knows where it's going to go? It's subject to a lot of risk. You know, the, the CEO can be caught in a scandal in, in one day, and so you buy it at, you buy it at one o'clock in the afternoon, and at two o'clock in the afternoon, there's an announcement that the CEO is in a scandal, and the stock drops in half. Holy, half, yeah, so you just lost 50%. That's the risk of individual stocks. And so market timing strategy is, look, forget that. You just wanna invest in the market averages, like the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the S&P 500. And so those are stock averages, and we'll learn how to compute those in a future chapter, like what exactly is a stock index in the market. We'll talk about that. So with the market strategy is, look, you, you buy low and you sell high on the overall market. So you hope that the Dow goes up, you buy into the Dow and you hope it's gonna go up in the near future, the S&P. And you get diversification effects. You don't have to worry about the chances of the stock market dropping 50% in one hour is, is almost zero. In a particular stock, it can happen and you're just unlucky. So you're better off, in some cases, trading the market for diversification facts. So this concludes the introduction to this course, the introductory chapter. It's a review of a lot of concepts you've seen, except, you know, this part right here, you probably haven't seen it.